where we got up to last time was we solved the adjoint of a PDU, which at least wrote out how you would solve the adjoint of a PDU. And uh, so, of course, the like thing that makes this all complicated is the fact that we don't just solve a PDE, we have a sequence of operations. So actually, even if you're only solving one PDE, you still have the operations before you solve the PDE where you set up initial conditions and so on. And you have the operations after you solve the PDE that get you to the point where you've evaluated some functional. And so you have to differentiate through all of those anyway. But much more significant, of course, is that very, very often you don't just solve one PDE. So you solve uh, a sequence of PDEs most frequently because you're touching them. So you just, you've done method of lines. And so you've got a special PDE at every time step or possibly multiple times every time step. And you have a whole sequence of them stacked up together. And so what we're going to move on to now is how you do that. And so this starts to bring in a lot of the mechanics that you would put in code. I'm going to, at this stage, try to keep this fairly conceptual. So what we're doing is what PyJoint does, but I'm not going to dwell on the actual objects and API that's in PyJoint. We'll probably have a subsequent session where I'll get to nuts and bolts of what PyJoint does, which will be of interest to some people and less interesting to other people. Uh, but here, what we're going to do is set up effectively the model problem. So um, a really typical, simple case of this looks like uh, my solution U, and I've got an old solution, and I initially set the next to the initial conditions, and I have my current solution, which I also set to the initial conditions, either directly or indirectly. And then I loop over time. And every time I do a time step, what I do is I solve a PDE and the PDE's residual is a function of U, and U old. And let's now, I think I was slightly confusing people last time. So let's write our PDEs in weak form and put an explicit uh, test function in there. Um, doesn't really change anything what we're writing out now, but it's it's how we do it. And so I'm solving this. So and then so that gets me you. So that's effectively an assignment operation that sets you. Um, and then after I've done that, I update. Right. And um, then we go around again, uh, and eventually we're done. And then I compute some sort of functional out the other end. And so a really simple but not completely unrealistic functional that I might in, uh, do would be uh, the square of the solution at the end of time plus the square of the initial conditions, right? And as usual, I need uh, D, J, D, whatever my controls are. And I could designate any variable in here as a control, um, but the uh, Kind of obvious one that I'm going to use that will make this fall out is for these purposes, we can assume that our initial conditions are the control. That makes sense, right? So I could, I'm asking myself, how would my solution change if I change my initial conditions? That's what Jaden UIC is, right? So I want to compute uh, the journey, the U on this, I guess, the semantic. This thing is a functional, so it's a function of u. Um, well, Ricky, which u? This is where we're immediately getting into uh, an issue, right? Because this is a function of u, and in fact, u old. Uh, 
kind of indexed, I'm going to use a high index there, which is confusing, but I'm running out of space to put indices, um, over all of time. Um, and it's also directly a function of UIC. So it's a, I want the derivative, that derivative um, with um, in the direction of uh, U hat, right? So it's a, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm constructing a functional. I have to have an arbitrary direction in the space that this guy lives in. And we're keeping our life slightly easy at the moment because we can reasonably assume that um, all of these U's and the V all come from the same function space. They're all from the same Hilbert space. Uh, they don't have to be and nothing really gets worse if they're not. Uh, but I'm just sort of keeping the symbols light. Okay, so um, what does the adjoint of this thing look like? Well, somehow I need to work out an expression for the whole function I'm evaluating. And I can do this by composing operations but this is where mathematical notation starts to really creak because um, one answer is um, simply that I write out all of the operations I would have done. So I need to unroll that loop. Um, and in order to successfully do that, we have to think about what's going to happen when I start computing the adjoint. So, we know from last time that the adjoint of one of these steps is going to be um, involve the FDU and the FD everything else in here, so the FDU old, um, which U and which U old, because U and U old are now program variables that keep changing over time. And this is where we hit a big difference between the way we normally think about maths and the way you think about at least an imperative language like Python or C or Fortran. And so mathematically, um, you tend to say that um, symbols have a meaning. They have one value. And in this context, they have that one value. Whereas, in an imperative language, we refer, we use variables as references to bits of computer's memory, which contain whatever they happen to currently contain, and a while later they might contain something else. And so in order to mathematically reason about this uh, uh, program, what we need to do is unwrap that. And so in um, computer science, and especially in the world of compilers, where this particular problem turns up a lot, um, then uh, what they talk about is SSA form. So SSA is static, single, assignment. So what that means is I am going to relabel all of my variables such that every variable only gets assigned to you once. So a variable gets a, a value, and if that value would change, we no longer change the value of the variable, we, we declare a new variable and use it. Now, it's important to understand at this point that this is a mathematical construct. So those of you who spend your time programming, probably having alarm bells going off in your head about the performance implications of spewing variables left, right, and center. Uh, the what you do to implement this is different from what you do to reason about it, at least at some level. So for just now, let's not worry about any performance implications, just think about what that means. And so effectively what that means is that um, these guys get, um, so this is U0 old, U0 old, and these guys get T's written on them. And I guess this one here, has to have a, um, that's a, a time big T at the end of time. And so now I've written this out and I could expand this loop out and every variable 
occurs in here once. So that's the first thing that I uh, need to do in order to get a well-formed problem. The next thing I need to worry about um, is the fact that um, variables can also be read more than once, right? So I can use the value of a variable more than once. And so uh, the most obvious place where that occurs here um, is UIC. So UIC got read here and it also got read down here. Uh, if you pay close attention, it also happens to UT because when I solve an implicit problem, UT is both an input, it's the initial guess in the solution, and uh, it's an output. So that means that U, uh, well, UT minus one gets read here and UT gets read here and those are the same uh, reading operations. Yeah, I guess technically if I, if I write this down here, I now have two variables in here, technically. Um, okay, so um, what that means is that what we were doing before of just stacking start, um, operations up by composing them, mathematically is now very inconvenient. And so um, I don't know of a more convenient way than this of writing together this function composition and this doesn't look like a function composition. So I think it's hard to think about what the chain rule is for this operation uh, and so then reason about its adjoint. Fortunately, there is a way out of this by drawing pictures. So what we're going to do, let's get rid of this over here. If we're going to draw a directed acyclic graph in DAG. So um, a DAG is, knows what it says on the tin. So it's a graph. I'm going to draw a bunch of nodes in a second. Um, it's directed. So the edges between the nodes have a direction um, and it's acyclic which means that I cannot follow edges in the direction of their arrows and ever get back to where I came from. Um, and the reason why all of those things are true is going to become immediately obvious. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with UIC and I'm going to put that in a circle. So that's the initial um, variable that I'm putting in. I'm going to put variables in circles. Then the first thing I did on the board was I assigned it into you old. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write a box, which is an assignment operation. And I'm going to write an arrow from this into here, an arrow out of this into you old. Okay. Um, so now we get some of the rules of what is going on here, right? So there's two sorts of um, uh, nodes that turn up in my graph. There are values and there are operations. And operations consume and produce values. And so that means that a rule is that arrows will always join a circle and a box. Because um, you can only compose operations by those operations producing values which are consumed by the next operation. And similarly, the only way to get a value from another value is an operation, even if that operation is really, really simple. And um, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, set, um, well, I might actually be illustrative, but let's just assume that I set that immediately for my signal. It's the same value. So now I can also have another arrow come out of here into a box and that will produce you. Um, you'll notice I'm not actually going to put 
the T's on, and the reason I'm not going to put the T's on is because in that representation, I don't need to. I'll show you why that is in just, just, just one more maneuver. So now, the next thing that's going to happen is the first one of these solve blocks. So that thing is a box, and it's a solve, and I won't write down the equation, but it's there. And so this thing consumes you all and you, and it produces um, <clears throat> you. And then that you goes into a assignment, and that assignment produces a you old. Okay, and then the same thing's going to happen again, right? So this you old, and uh, this you and this you old are going to go into another salt block down the bottom there. And we'll keep doing that as required. Um, so now, if all loop is not expressed in the graph, that's why it's acyclic because you just you just right. You just there is no so. Um, <laughs> what we are doing is what I did in the single assignment code. I'm unrolling the loop, right? Um, and uh, you don't have to do it like that. You can represent a program uh, you, where the, uh, knowing where the loops are. Um, the challenge then I'll come back to in a bit. So this, the, you're a little bit ahead, ahead of where we are. So I explain why why we wouldn't do that in a second. In in, um, in Pydrake, uh, we also have linear uh, variational problems as well as nonlinear ones. Right. So, so does it just turn those linear ones into nonlinear ones, and then the nonlinear yes. one is recorded? Because Pydrake doesn't actually have uh, nonlinear variational solvers. It's, it's got a wrapper around. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, there are linear solvers and they're different. But mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm trying to not do the implementation of yeah, Pyrrhic adjunct yeah. right now, right? Yeah. I'm trying to be one level more abstract. Um, so when I have the same letter in a different bubble, that's the encoding for the single uh, static single assignment form because it means that this is the same. Uh, program variable, the same location in memory originally, but these are different values of it because going through this solve block, the value of this thing changes. So in static single assignment, we consider those to be different um, uh, variables. Um, so I will introduce one piece of pi joints or pi break joint terminology at this point because I won't be able to stop myself from using it. Um, we talk about uh these things then these um circles which represent a single value of a variable as block variables and i'll talk about program variables and block variables right the program variable is the one that was originally there these block variables are these single value variables that turn up um here and these things therefore are called blocks so that that calling those blocks is very very standard terminology um because and now I'll come back to why are we doing it like this? How did I get this? And the answer is that um, there are, broadly speaking, two different ways that you could arrive at this sort of representation or a understanding of this representation of an algorithm. You can either read the source code and understand that it's there or you can watch the program execute and see what happens. And those are broadly speaking, the two approaches to uh, algorithmic differentiation that exist out there. So there's source to source, where you have what amounts to a specialist compiler that reads the source code and writes out an output. And you have operator overloading, where you replace all the operators in your program with operators which execute the statement but are also watching the statement occurring and recording it happening. And what happens in um, Firebreak at the level of Python code is the second one of those, right? That's also true um, for currently all of the uh, widely used machine learning frameworks. 
So we mentioned earlier that solving adjoint PDE is the same operation as back propagation. And uh, the, the widely used PyTorch, TensorFlow, they all um, record the operations as they go along. Uh, essentially because it's much, much, much more robust than having to reason about the code. So actually, uh, the first version of TensorFlow uh, did do a static analysis. They read the source and worked out what the flow was, and they changed in version two. PyTorch was always this version. We work exactly the same way. So this is the version we're going to talk about. And um, so because you are recording these operations as they happen, uh, the code that's recording it doesn't know that this happened inside a loop. And so that's why you just get flattened huge loops out. If you did know that you were going to do a loop, then you could put a loop in the system. And uh, the time when you would know that you were doing a loop would be if instead of having a loop here in your native language, so instead of having a Python loop in our case, uh, you had some sort of structure in your um, PDE solving abstraction that put the loop in. And that's what happens if you've got a time stepping library. So people who use PET CTS or um, James Madison's um, time stepping library that whose name now escapes me, um, because they know what the time step is, they can effectively record a loop in, in here. And, and the, that has advantages, the disadvantages, you have to fit that abstraction. It's always the trade-off. Right. But we don't do that. So we just have this sequence of steps that are all the way through. Um, so now the good news is that what this does is turns our... Uh, it splits our problem up. It splits our problem up into how do I reason about the tape and then how do I take the adjoint of every operation on the tape? Oh, I mentioned the tape. Okay. So I said what we do is we observe the program running and we write down all the operations as they occur. This is a technology that was invented, I think, in the 70s, certainly about that long ago. And so they used intuitive language for computer storage that everybody un would understand. So if you remember your 1970s films, you have these enormous reel-to-reel -reel tapes that are recording things. And so when you need to record something, it goes onto a tape. And in the terminology of what happened then, the things you wrote to tapes were called blocks. So the reason these things are called blocks is because the 1970s and we're stuck with it. It's the same as the reason that your uh, save icon in your computer is a little picture of a floppy disk that nobody's got anymore. Nothing wrong with things created in the 70s. You only just qualified. <laughs> um, so, um, the, um, so what happens then is um, I execute my program and I get a tape and the tape is simply a list of blocks. If you implement it in Python, it's literally a list of blocks. Dave, uh, uh, just, a, just a second, because I, I didn't get the... So the block is the square or the block is... The uh... block is a square. Okay. Block is uh, operation. Okay. And the red one and the round one is a... How do you call it? The, we call them block variables. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is in your library that has been set up to employ a suitable... Um, operator overloading uh, library such as PyJoins, all of the operations that your system knows about have been replaced by a wrapper operation in, uh, for us is literally a decorator, which sits around the operation and says, do the operation and record that you've done it. So um, what's going to uh, happen then is we're going to have a record of all the blocks. And as you go through them, these objects that are variables that we know how to reason about 
they also have to be overloaded. So the way you do that in an object-oriented language is these are uh, subclasses of a type which knows about how to be taped. Um, so I, I, get, I guess in the DAG representation, it's like you don't actually have to have the circles at all, right? Because it's like the arrows carry values. You can think about that if you want to. Like you can, uh, so... You, but it's easy to see what, like how to map that to the algorithm if you've given those arrows names. Right, that's right. So the so that, that is correct. You, you could, if you preferred, only put boxes on your DAG and write these names onto the onto the arrows, it would be an isomorphic uh, setup. Um, I am drawing the DAG like this uh, exactly because if you ask FireJoint to visualize a DAG for you, it will show you this. Um, and so this is how I think about them. If you want to think about labeled arrows, you can think about labeled, labeled arrows. Um, instead, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, you have to be, if you're going to think about labeled arrows, uh, you have to think ever so carefully about the reuse of variables. So you'd have to show this as a, an arrow that forks. Um, so, um, okay, so what then happens um, as we um, run forward? So these um, variables, they're wrapping around a Python variable which uh, changes, or a C or a Fortran variable which changes. But when I come to a particular instance of this solve, what do I need? Well, I'm going to evaluate, among other things, the F du, and I'm going to evaluate the F du at ut minus one, ut old, um, so I need not whatever value you happens to have because I've done all these other calculations in it. I need the value that you had at this point. So actually what all of these bubbles have associated with them is the capacity to store, uh, we can call it UT, the value at a particular time. Um, and um, also other values. And the other values that you're going to need to be able to support are U star and U prime. And so this is the uh, adjoint value for this variable, and this is the tangent linear value for this variable. You may or may not be actually storing these at any given point. We will come back to when those are in play and when they're not. Um, and if you want to be able to do higher order adjuncts we haven't talked about uh, at all, you might be stacking up more values on that. But basically these are, these are a receptacle of the state of this in its, at the point it was evaluated, Potentially, it's gradient at that point. Potentially, it's adjoint at that point. Um, and so then what we do um, is uh, we um, this gives us a few operations on the tape. Okay, so uh, the first and simplest operation I can do on the tape is if I've remembered all of these stages, I could run the program again. Right? And so one thing I can do is I can set this guy's U2, I can set this guy's initial value and set the initial value of any other inputs. And you can tell what's an input because it doesn't have any arrows going into it. Um, and then I can run the tape forward. And because I put the blocks onto the tape in the order that I executed them originally, the tape is by definition a correct um, topological sort of this DAG. So it means that I will by definition hit all the blocks in an order that means that I have already evaluated the inputs. Yes. What if you have branching? So that's an excellent question. 
And the answer is that what we are doing is differentiating the program as we executed it, which means that uh, what we have is an evaluation, a linearization of the program around the point it executed at, which is in some locality, and that locality in particular is smaller than any branch, right? So if you okay. moved, so if you moved your states by enough to go over a branch point, um, then you wouldn't have, you, you would not observe that. Um, and what is in essence going on, uh, it's fine, we'll ignore that. Uh, what in essence is going on is that your, um, your program is not differentiable. Yeah. And you- That makes sense. Yeah, and you've hit uh, that point. Or at least the you didn't know how to differentiate those operations. So uh, a branch can be differentiable if you're very careful about what the values are on either side of the branch, right? So if I um, if I had some implementation of a function which did this, so it was x squared here and zero here, that's a differentiable branch. But it's not you, by observing the code, you would find it very difficult to know that it was a differentiable branch. So um, it's you have got yeah. conditional. Uh, which is just sort of ignoring. No, you well that I mean your conditional is just the branch. Yeah. And we don't we don't have a good differentiator to it. Um it's very, very hard to do. But anyway, so to the extent to which we are in a differentiable space, um, I can do this and I can then reevaluate all these guys. And what that will do is set all the UTs as they go down. And every time I evaluate a uh block, it will read not the program variable, but the stored value on each one. Um, and at some point in the future, we might have discussions about how you store that, where you store that. Could be this could be memory. Um, all that is a, like further complications beyond what we care about. We only care right now that you can get those back. Um, and so then, at the other end, at the bottom, I would get J out. And if you imagine that what you were doing was you're solving an optimization problem, then that enables you to evaluate your um, quantity of interest at any value of control that you wanted. So you needed that. Um, the next thing I could do, it's the easier one to, uh, to explain, is I could um, evaluate the tangent linear model of this DAG. And so in order to evaluate the tangent linear model, so remember what I'm doing then is, okay, we'll have to lose this, but we've still got a representation over here, so that's fine. I'm evaluating the J, D, in this case, U, I, C, um, for a initial U, I, C value. Then we need to write down U now, because we're going to calculate that along the way. Um, in the direction of a particular choice of U prime, right? So one tangent linear model forward gives you the direction with respect to one input. That's kind of why we wanted to do adjuncts, right? Was because we want more than one input, we want full space of inputs. Um, but so this is now uh, a concrete value. So what do I do? I walk over here and I set the, the UT to whatever value I'm putting in here. And I also set the u prime to whatever value I chose. And I do the same thing again. I evaluate all the blocks forward. And every time I hit block, um, I evaluate both the action of the block and the derivative of the action. So that means that when I wrote the overload for this, I needed to keep a reference to how to evaluate this operation. And you need to also somehow know how to uh, um, uh, take its derivative. For derivative, and in a minute, it's adjunct a derivative. Um, and there's basically two answers to how I could do that. Uh, the most straightforward answer, and the one that is true for us most of the time, is um, it is because I told it. So. Assignment is a linear operation, the derivative of the sum is assignment, so that bit's fine. Um, 
the slightly more sophisticated answer, which is um, the reason why uh, a pro uh, something like Firedrake uh, can have an automated agent, is if I get to this point and I hit the solve, and I want the tangent linear model of the solve which we wrote down yesterday, I'm going to need the FDU, but because F is written in a symbolic language, it's written for us in the unified form language, I can do that. So I can arm this thing with essentially a subfunction that knows how to derive its derivative and its adjoint operation. Um, the generalization of that is I could just provide some sort of external call. So people will be aware that uh, Nassim Buziani has put uh, PyTorch coupling into Firedrake. So in that world, one of these boxes might be go away and evaluate a neural network in PyTorch. And so when we ask for a derivative, we just shell out and say, go away PyTorch and do, the, do your derivative. And what, PyTorch, what that effectively means is that PyTorch is going to have a tape inside the block and they just compose together. And so, um, those are the ways that uh, that works. Um, when I'm doing the tangent linear model, it's a completely arbitrary implementation choice as to whether I execute the whole trace with ut and write all the uts out and then execute the whole trace again, evaluating the derivatives as I go down using all of those state variables or whether I do them all at once, right? I could just go down, evaluate UT, evaluate U prime, throw out UT immediately. That would be what's called the dual number approach to forward mode algorithmic differentiation, right? So a uh, tangent linear model, same thing as forward mode algorithmic differentiation. Um, if I, uh, now, but now I want to do the adjoint and the adjoint is more challenging because, as we commented previously, the adjoint involves evaluating the chain rule from left to right instead of right to left. Or, in this case, from the bottom of the tree all the way back up. And so, um, what I have to do is um, this, so when I go forward, solve writes u. That means that solve also writes u prime. Right? The, it's going to write the u t on here, which is the state, and it's going to write the u prime on here. So the arrows for the tangent linear model are the same as the arrows for the forward model. Um, up to optimizations where you can work out where. Things are linear and those drop off. Um, when I evaluate the adjoint, this solve block's job is to set the adjoint values here and in fact here. And um, so that implies that when we run the adjoint, I have to run the tape backwards because it's going to consume this adjoint value here. Right? So this adjoint value here has to exist before that solve can execute. And this adjoint value is going to come out afterwards. So turn all the arrows round and run backwards. This is why it's called reverse mode AD. This is why machine learning people call it back propagation. Um, so what that means um, is that in order to, in the simplest case, so leaving aside checkpointing, which is a discussion we will have in a whole other session sometime later, um, in order to evaluate the adjoint, what I have to do is run the tape forward, store all of the UTs so that they're available, and then I run the adjoint backwards and calculate all the U stars until eventually I get UIC star at the end and I um, 
and I had the derivative that I was after. So the U primes going forward as well for the adjoint. I do not need the U primes for the adjoint. Okay. Uh, so the reason why I don't need the U primes for the adjoint um, is um, that. So what am I doing? I'm just doing chain rules. So I'm doing F of G of is two enough? Right, that's in single variable land, what my um, forward model looks like. So this is J. And so what I want is DJ being mu. And because I've only given myself a single variable, this is a simpler ex expression than when I wrote it last time. This is the F, the G, the G, the uh, H, the H, the U. Um, using U star. And then um, what I do is I um, compute. So I start off, ah, how do I start the process? So when I ran forward, I said, well, I'm going to set off by telling you what the initial value of UC is. And I also have to tell you what the direction that I want to take uh, U prime in is at this end, right? So um, when I take, when I go backwards, what I'm actually doing is I'm defining, so this variable here um, is the uh, variable, the thing that comes out of here, so it's actually um, H star. And I now am conflating them, so I'm now labeling my arrows. Right. Um, and so uh, and, and so I achieve this by saying H star uh, H star gets uh, the G the H adjoint applied to adjoint. But what how do I get the FTG ad, adjoint? Well, that is in turn an operator that applies to something, right? But F, F goes from whatever space G lives in to R. And so F star, so you would be F the G star, that goes from R star G star. Now R star is just R because R is uh, has a trivial linear product to itself adjoining. Um, and um, so the good news here is um, if I have to choose a direction in R, there's only one. So the answer here is I'm going to seed my adjoint. I'm going to seed it with a one because it's the uh, it's the only um, it's the only choice there. Uh, you can um, if you are coupling adjoint frameworks together. So I mentioned to you earlier you can even couple PyDrake and PyTorch. Well, if we had PyTorch outside PyDrake instead of the other way around, then actually the uh, last thing wouldn't go into R. It would go into some arbitrary space. And we'd need a direction in the arbitrary space, and the direction would be whatever the outside um, method gives us. Right? They give us an adjoint value, and we propagate it back. So, um, so that's the answer to so to answer then um, Lawrence's question. I didn't at any point in doing this need a tangent linear value because I'm only I only propagate derivatives in the in the reverse direction. I, so I only ever evaluate a a derivative that's got a star on it. Yeah. Um, if you want a second derivative, if you want to compute a Hessian action, then the ways of doing a Hessian action are basically by composing first order derivatives. 
So you either do adjoint calculation over a tangent linear calculation or a tangent linear calculation over an adjoint calculation. And if you're doing those things, then you need to carry around more of this stuff in order to make that work, right? But we're not there. For right now, you don't need the U primes in order to evaluate the uh, tangent linear operation. Um, jumping ahead, uh, the fact that I have to record all of these UTs means the adjoint is effectively a massive memory leak. If you run lots and lots of time steps, I have to record all of the steps along the way. Uh, and so um, the stuff that Diane and I are working on now is basically combating that. Um, and the way you would do that, the very rough sketch, is uh, if I draw a line through this graph at any point, then as long as I have the values corresponding to any arrows that cross that line, I can recommence computing at that point. And so what checkpointing is, is basically choosing the points at which to put those lines at and storing the values associated with the arrows that cross that line and not bothering to store any of the other intermediate values. And when we need those, we come back and recompute them because we can restart them. That is for another lecture. Okay. Uh, the last thing I think I want to talk about, um, so I tend to now, uh, that will explain uh, the DAG part is something that I haven't quite told you about. I've been very um, slapdash and loose. So let's suppose we are computing uh, DJD UIC and we have somehow got all the way back to here. So I've got this U star and I've got this U star, which is the old star. And these are assignments. So the adjoint of an assignment is just an assignment, right? It's the identity operation. It's derivative is itself, it's adjoint is itself. It's a very boring operation. So that means that by tracing back through these arrows, and through this equal sign, I know that UIC is equal to U star old. U star IC. So that's my answer. Except that by tracing back through these arrows, I know that U star IC is equal to um, U star, and not U star old. And that's definitely a different value. So how do I resolve that problem? Well, the answer is that by having this variable read twice, reading a variable twice is effectively a hidden operation. Right. And the uh, and in fact, the fact that variables are read, uh, read twice was the reason why this stacking up the function notation didn't work. It's the reason why I needed a DAG at all in order to express what was going on, right? It's because it's not just a linear sequence of operations, each of one feeds directly into the next one. I can reuse values all over the place. In fact, in the original um, uh, functional I wrote down, U of C has a line that goes all the way down to the bottom because it was directly in the um, function. So what, um, what, what is it? How do I resolve the fact that multiple blocks think they get to solve the adjoint for U star. So the answer is, let's suppose I um, do what Lawrence wanted me to do originally, and I label arrows. So let's call this one UICA, and this one is UICB. So now I've got effectively an extra block in here, and the extra block is given by um, uh, S split of U on C is simply equal to U on C A. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean, I don't want to write that down. UIC, UIC. 
or equivalently. So there's my block. U I C A. U I C B. So U I C A. U I C B is equal to um, S of I C, which is just equal to this. Right. So I don't actually need the S in there. I can just take this. Now let's uh, compute the S, the U. Right, so the S, the UIC is simply, oh, well, it's a gas derivative. So in the direction of U prime, that is simply equal to uh, the UIC, the UIC, the UIC, the UIC, one, one. Uh, U I C Okay, so that's not a big surprise because I that's actually all I wrote up there. It's a linear operator. I take its derivative. I get itself back. That 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 bit's fine. <clears throat> so now let's ask, what's its adjunct? Well, this is just a little L two in a product. So we know how adjuncts going to look like here. So this thing is a function originally that goes from um, whatever this space is to two of this space, this space cross this space. And so U star, the S, the U I C star in the direction of U, um, in the direction of, a, of an adjoint variable. So the adjoint variable is going to be um, in U space because it's going backwards, is equal to the adjoint of this, which is simply one, one, times the adjoint of inputs. So U. A star C U star B minus C, which is simply equal to U star A minus C plus U star B minus C. So the adjoint of scatter is plus. And so actually, so what you could do if you really wanted to be pedantic about um, uh, labeling operations is you could, um, every time you have two arrows coming out of something, you could replace that by a split block, which would um, uh, record the values going out. Um, and uh, when we have actual UFL split, which is, not quite the same operation. That is basically what we have to do because we have to make sure the split occurs at the right point in time. Um, but what we do in the usual case, don't do that at all. You can just do a little implementation trick. And the implementation trick is you say, actually, blocks don't set the adjoint variables of their inputs. We initialize all those adjoint variables to zero and blocks add in to the adjoint value of their inputs, and then it all just works. Okay. Is that because like the adjoint blocks are all linear operators, and so it? Uh, no, it's just because, I mean, so adjoint blocks are all linear operators, but you don't need that for this. It's because this one operation I wrote down here is a linear operation. OK. Right, so all you're doing is you're giving a sui generous implementation of the fact that uh, reading a variable more than once results in an adjoint value, which is the sum of those values. Okay, so it's kind of only done for assignment. It's no, it's it's not. So it's not the fact that it's assignment here that did that. So the same thing would happen when this u gets used in the assignment of the solve. Mm -hmm. Right. What's going on is 
effectively that by reading this twice, we are making two arrows. And as you rightly pointed out earlier, I can think of that as two single subject assignment variables according to this formula here, right? It's a function which simply copies an input into two outputs. Okay. And then when I come back through the adjoint, I have to adjoin this operation. <clears throat> yeah. And as I just arrived, the adjoint of this operation is simply the sum of the adjoints of the split parts. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, it's literally, we're literally adjoining the operation and taking two arrows out of one hole. Um, so if you prefer, I could write it like this, and then essentially I need to write a little box in here, which is the block of doing that, but at least we don't, and I'm not aware that anyone else would actually put that operation in because we, it, it, it has a very easy adjoint, so we just use it accordingly. Okay, so, uh, aura est, as they say. Um, and so that's the end of uh, where we're up to now, and I will contemplate what we're going to do next time. <laughs>